eh bien, eh bien, Bonjour à tous et bienvenue, bienvenue pour cette nouvelle année, ce lancement de séminaire donc, euh, qui sera animé aujourd'hui par euh, Axel Brémont, mon scientifique euh, égyptologue euh, à l'IFAO. Et donc, euh, je lui passe euh, immédiatement Bonjour la parole. Bienvenue, bienvenue pour cette nouvelle année, ce lancement de séminaire. Yanni. Bon, euh, merci en, tous à, en tout cas à tous d'être là, d'être venus. Et puis, euh, c'est à toi, Axel. Merci. Um, is it working fine? All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining in that many uh, at the first session of the uh, seminar of the IFO uh, this year. It is my privilege to introduce uh, Fatma Kesk and Clara Joite. Uh, Fatma Kesk got her PhD from Berlin Freie Universität. Uh, she did an ethnographic study on open courtyards, but also on street uses. So we hope she comes back sometime to speak to us about the latter. <laughs> and she is the current holder of the Joint uh, Polish Institute and IFAO Fellowship. She's preparing a large symposium on domestic archaeology that will take place next November. As for Clara Joite, she was a foreign scientific member of the IFO in 2012, uh, and she's now a senior member of the uh, Deutsche Archaeologisches Institut. Uh, she specializes in the, she is specialized in the study of lithic materials, as well as urban archaeology in general, and especially she's involved in the uh, archaeological research at uh, Balot and uh, Dakhla Oasis as a whole. And it is, of course, our privilege to have her as the respondent for this conference. I will uh, shortly say a few words about ethnoarchaeology for anyone who would not be uh, familiar with what this uh, entails. Um, of course, ethno ethnography and archaeology were uh, entangled at the beginning of both disciplines, but seldom for the good reasons. British archaeologist David Clark had a very skeptical word, uh, word towards ethnoarchaeology. I don't know if you know it, uh, Fatma, he famously said, I like to keep my archaeology dead. <laughs> uh, so obviously, uh, and luckily, Fatma did not follow such an opinion, but it is true that uh, in the 20th century, uh, especially the first half, uh, the comparison between living and past societies was completely trivialized, um, mainly because of evolutionist and primitivist backgrounds, uh, as you would know, uh, which would basically hold that any society with a non-industrial economy could more or less be equated, and which saw no problem in viewing Melanesian or African or Siberian people as a perfect copy of how prehistoric societies uh, may have worked. And indeed, the practice of comparatism in general uh, had become almost taboo until uh, the 1960s or 1970s uh, because of this long phase uh, where both archaeology and ethnology were characterized by holistic great narratives, oftentimes failing to grasp historic and or regional particularisms. Hence, Clark's strong words or the declaration by Chris uh, Gosden in 1999, I feel that ethnoarchaeology is immoral in that we have no justification for using the present of one society simply to interpret the past of another, especially as the present is often seen as a latter-day survival of stages past elsewhere in the world. Obviously, we're not going to stop at that. <laughs> this is a, a very... Uh, a skeptical and, uh, and uh, negative view of ethnoarchaeology, but since the 1990s, of course, uh, this discipline has been fully able to integrate these critics and to be refounded away from such primitivist uh, assumptions. As uh, I'm quoting here Nicholas David, who is uh, the author of a manual on the subject, if you're ever interested in it. Uh, so as the ethnographic study of living cultures from archaeological perspectives oriented towards providing material for analogy. And uh, perhaps we can recognize that it has been used uh, when dealing with mostly practical, technical, pragmatic questions, especially when it comes to technologies, craft 
craftsmanships or uh, savoir-faire, which are not or not anymore practiced in our uh, society and which we cannot grasp except if we observe people who use them on a daily basis. Uh, André leroy gouin already in the 1970s and his some um, L'homme et la matière, would have attempted to study and categorize all human techniques uh, or techni, <laughs> and use this data on living society to interpret objects uh, from the archaeological record uh, because the environment proposes an inevitable and limited choice. I'm quoting here, him here. Uh, and it is because man has no effect on wood, for example, unless he cuts it from a certain angle and with a determined pressure that the handles and shapes of tools can be classified. So he used this experience with living societies to classify tools. And therefore, uh, I, I think we're gonna discuss this afterwards, but probably the most seminal works, at least in my opinion, of ethno-archeologist and experimental archeology span with which it often goes hand in hand, uh, to this date have tackled uh, the for example, the average use life of pottery in order to be able to approximate the time of occupation of an archaeological site or the traces uh, left by a structure after the dismantlement or abandonment of a settlement or uh, the constitution of referentials for the analysis of traces on ancient material. I'm saying that especially because uh, as some of you may know, I work with traceology. So uh, with this forward uh, on the pros and cons of uh, ethno-archaeology and mostly the pros nowadays. Uh, I'm leaving uh, the mic to uh, Fatima to hear about open courtyards in ancient Egypt and ethno-archaeological study. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for uh, being here. I would like to begin by uh, thanking um, uh, each one for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak to you today. And thank you so much, Axel, for the introduction and uh, for uh, uh, giving me the floor uh, to talk about uh, my uh, research that combines uh, archaeology to ethno-archaeology. Ethno uh, so uh, today I present to you part of my PhD research that was achieved at the Free University of Berlin in, 2020, uh, in 2021 uh, with the title of an ethno-archaeological study of streets and open courtyards from modern Nubia and ancient Egyptian settlements from the pre-dynastic period to the end of the Middle Kingdom. Today I chose to to uh, focus more on my research on open uh, courtyards. Um, and uh, it can be said that, uh, as said in the cinema industry, this presentation is some adaptation of <laughs> an important part of my PhD uh, dissertation. Uh, also, at the start of uh, the presentation and uh, building on what uh, Axel perfectly uh, explained, uh, I would like to add a little disclaimer uh, that the use of ethnoarchaeology for me uh, as it is here a method of research and does not uh, at all entail that what we study in the modern ethnographic record must have existed uh, in ancient Egyptian records. 
Uh, here in this research, ethnoarchaeology is used as a tool of interdisciplinary uh, research, as I will explain uh, further. So what is meant uh, by an open courtyard? Uh, Maria Correas uh, proposed in her PhD thesis that was achieved uh, in 2013 at Durham University, uh, and that dealt with Egyptian mud brick houses and proposed an ethno-archaeological uh, methodology to study these houses. She stated that the identification of the open courtyard space in the archaeological record of ancient Egyptian houses is really problematic. Due to the spaces with a decayed roof to be mistakenly identified as courtyards, and such methodological problem was not clearly solved in the literature of ancient Egyptian houses. In the context of this research, open courtyard is meant to define an unroofed space located within a domestic household uh, that is under study. In ancient Egypt, spaces that were described as courtyards exist in the archeological record of houses temples, tombs, and administrative buildings too. However, the focus of my presentation and discussion today is the open courtyard in the domestic context of ancient Egyptian houses. The slow development of settlement archeology span research in Egypt until the 1960s, and for sure the limited settlement remains, has limited our knowledge of many possible varieties of the ancient Egyptian house forms that was mostly limited until the 1970s to house forms that were listed in typologies based on the record known from Amarna, Lahon, and Deir al-Madina. Despite the acknowledgement of functional open spaces uh, that were described as courtyards, sometimes uh, described as courtyards and sometimes not, within the domestic sphere of ancient Egyptian uh, households at prehistoric and pre-dynastic and early dynastic settlements uh, in Egypt, su such as uh, Merinda Mani Salama by Tristan, uh, pre-dynastic Ma'adi by Rizana, and early dynastic uh, Bhutu by Hartung and his team. These acknowledgements uh, of the courtyard space that appeared uh, in the earliest settlements of Egypt links well with the suggestions of Peter Lakovara that uh, who rejected the previous typologies of ancient Egyptian houses and proposed that later various uh, forms originally originated uh, from the simple plan that he called the divided court plan where a single roofed space is annexed to an outdoor domestic space of the household. Following the ancient Egyptian chronology, Felix Arnold states that an open courtyard space definitely exists in the, Egypt, in the ancient Egyptian houses since the Old Kingdom. For Middle Kingdom, a space that is identified as an open courtyard clearly exists in the typologies of ancient Egyptian houses proposed by Manfred Bitak, Barry Camp, Cornelius von Pilgrim, Miriam Müller, Felix Arnold, Peter Lakovara, and Nadine Müller. However, the interpretation uh, challenge remains. The majority of previous research that acknowledged the presence of open courtyards focused on offering different shapes of house ground plans as discovered at settlements such as Tal Daba, Lahun, Elephantine, and other sites, with occasionally available little descriptions and interpretation for the functions of the different house spaces, including open courtyards. While Felix Arnold, who confirmed that the arid hot climate most of the year long in Egypt had impacted the design of ancient Egyptian houses and for sure necessitated the, pres the presence of an open space, he also clearly stated that it is almost impossible to define a definite function for spaces inside ancient Egyptian houses. Cornelius von Pilgrim, on the other hand, suggested that spaces inside the Middle Kingdom houses of Elephantine, including open courtyards, were mostly multifunctional. The results of my research in understanding the functions of open courtyards, as will be discussed, confirms more the latter suggestion of von Pilgrim. 
And as we still live at the same climatic phase as ancient Egypt, one of the purposes of having an open courtyard is probably applicable until today. It was mostly Florence Doyen who attempted to offer further interpretation of open courtyard functions in Middle Kingdom houses of Lahun and Elephantine and Wahsut, and divided them through suggested categories based on their locations, layout, and installations. And uh, of course, uh, as we can see uh, here, and uh, some examples of uh, what I personally uh, prefer to describe as models of uh, architectural uh, architectural models of uh, ancient Egyptian houses. I was uh, uh, putting aside the, all the debate about their original use, but for me, these uh, represent obvious courtyards. Uh, in the houses. Uh, very brief mentions of possible similar patterns uh, between specific features in the excavated Egyptian houses and their possible modern uh, counterparts has been proposed by some archaeologists like Petrie, Hoffman, Arnold, and Lacovara. These suggestions were, however, solely based on their brief encounter with some Egyptian modern houses that they briefly witnessed in the surroundings of their excavated settlements. At the same time, scholars outside of the field of Egyptology and Egyptian archaeology, notably from the fields of architecture and anthropology, have strongly acknowledged the significance of open and outdoor spaces in general and more specifically open courtyards in the domestic sphere of modern and contemporary rural houses in Egypt, by stressing the fact of their multifunctionality. Previous ethno-archaeological research uh, beyond ancient Egypt highlighted the necessity of ethnographic approaches in the study of ancient spaces. Uh, Hader in 1967 noted that for ethno-archaeology, Archaeological research can be argued to be a special kind of ethnological research. That's slightly the first in its tools of application, while Cunningham pointed to the fact that ethnoarchaeology has an important function in understanding the complex meanings of the majority of material patterns uh, through analogical reasoning, as explained by Kramer and Graham. Uh, here I listed some of uh, the previous uh, studies on uh, the modern uh, rural uh, houses uh, in Egypt that acknowledge the importance, the presence, and the significance of uh, the open courtyard space. Uh, I was personally strongly affected by uh, the research of Hassan Fathi and his team uh, in, on uh, the houses of uh, Lower Nubia in the 1960s. And uh, of course, as well, the work of uh, Nassim Hanin and Mary Gergis in Upper Egypt, uh, where they all acknowledge uh, the, the functionality and the significance of an open uh, courtyard in the uh, domestic sphere of rural uh, houses. On the other hand, and as did, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Petrie and other archaeologists who started to notice or to suggest similarities and continuities between uh, ancient Egyptian houses and modern uh, rural houses. I had the same impression while being an archeologist at Elephantine for uh, some uh, uh, successive uh, years, going through uh, the modern village to reach the archeological site of ancient Elephantine was just for me the same experience. I, I uh, I always felt that there is something that strongly compares the urban fabric uh, that persisted since ancient uh, Elephantine and continued also uh, in the modern uh, village. Uh, when I took a step uh, further, uh, I found out that there are uh, a lot of uh, literature that acknowledges uh, the importance of uh, studying ancient outdoor uh, spaces annexed to uh, the ancient houses. And 
uh, I like to uh, show specifically these uh, photos uh, because they show uh, similarity in the width of the streets between the ancient and the modern uh, village. And also they show uh, some important installation like the mastabas or the benches where people uh, sit just outside uh, their houses and where they see anyone uh, passing by, they just tell, invite him to sit uh, with them. And there are specific uh, moments in the day where they use this uh, social space. So this uh, shows how uh, this, uh, uh, the significance of this uh, open space in their uh, daily life. So what was the foundations uh, of my methodology? As discussed uh, earlier, my research uh, here builds on uh, the acknowledgement of the open courtyard space in the research on ancient Egyptian houses, and also uh, on the available knowledge of the open courtyard space in the rural, modern, and contemporary houses, and the combination of archaeological and ethnographic methods of research. Uh, to go with the archaeological uh, methods here, um, I decided to have uh, the approach or uh, the method applied by uh, David Clark uh, in his uh, important uh, reference, uh, Spatial Archaeology, uh, where he suggests that we must divide uh, the any given uh, settlement or any given uh, site, a settlement or a cemetery, uh, two different levels of information. So the semi-micro level that entails the level of the whole uh, settlement and also uh, the micro level, which is the level of uh, single uh, buildings, uh, houses, or any other uh, building. This is com combined with uh, ethnographic approaches uh, that uh, studies a, a modern uh, case uh, study through the approach of uh, Escher uh, that is called the new analogy. And as is explained by uh, Blake, Space is no longer limited by its geographical instances, but it is a theoretical discourse across the humanities and social sciences. So uh, my modern uh, case study in this uh, research was uh, the village of Bega that is uh, located uh, next to the uh, old um, old dam, old Aswan uh, dam uh, in the Shalal uh, area on the on the island of uh, Bega. So here we see on the left side uh, a map for uh, the island, the whole island that contains two different uh, villages. Bale and Biga. My research was mainly on uh, Biga. Uh, so uh, Biga it uh, now and since uh, I started my research there um, was uh, an abandoned village since the 1980s. It has nothing to do with any uh, abon previous abandonment of uh, Nubian uh, villages. Uh, but it has to do with uh, the inhabitants deciding to leave the village because they uh, had no uh, electricity, no infrastructure. So gradually they started to, to leave the village uh, and moved out uh, to other places, but they kept the ownership of the houses and the houses are standing to 22 houses, all of them standing. Uh, that offers a wonderful chance uh, for researchers uh, to study uh, this village. Uh, I started, as I said, by uh, splitting uh, the, the village into different levels of uh, information. Uh, so the, the semi-micro level, that is the, the level of the whole uh, village, and the micro level, uh, which is the level of single uh, buildings. Uh, and one of the first uh, analysis that I have done is to understand what is the open space on the level of the village? Why do people need to, to use the open space? 
we might take this uh, for granted and we say um, we this is these are open spaces and yeah what 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 do we, why do we need to to use to understand this or to ana analyze this uh, however uh, in this context of uh, nubian village on an island uh, people use heavily use the open space for uh, their daily life and after the analysis um, in the color-coded map i could identify the different uh, pathways we can call them streets but in this context i prefer to call them pathways um, i could identify what we can call for the moment open public uh, spaces the trash disposal areas uh, the different agricultural fields and the terraces and the houses. Uh, in order to understand, uh, to have a deeper level of understanding, uh, we had to understand also the, um, the different um, usage and activities that happens in these uh, spaces. Examples of the spaces are the, the of the open spaces on the level of the village are the quays, uh, the field, the, the fields, the trash dumps, and the open uh, playground. Uh, the activities that happened and here is it's important to differ between two things: defining a space and a location of the space does not mean that it defines what happens in this space. So that's why these are two different levels of uh, analysis. If we say this is an uh, an open space, uh, what happens in this open space? Do we have a field? Do we have an water installation? Do we have an area for food uh, storing? Or we simply have a graffiti, which I analyzed also as uh, an activity in uh, the open uh, space. Uh, combining Another level of ethnographic uh, research was the discussions with some of the, inhab the previous inhabitants of the, the village. Uh, unfortunately, there, they were not, uh, they, there was no access to many of them, only representatives and also some of the uh, inhabitants of the surrounding villages. Uh, there they could explain uh, how did they use the, the water installation, like a shadoof, for example, like uh, a water uh, channel uh, to get to let the water in for the for the fields, and uh, so on. An important level of study was to make uh, this uh, connection between the open spaces of the whole village and also the open spaces of uh, the houses. How to go from studying uh, a village directly to go to study a house. There is a transition in between. And this transition for me in this, in this case was the understanding uh, for me and my colleagues uh, was the understanding uh, of um, the, the topography and the natural uh, landscape of the site where the people decided to build their houses and why. Uh, so here I give you the example of house uh, 10. Uh, house 10, one of the largest houses of, uh, of the village uh, in plan and in section above. So in the plan, we can uh, see there are uh, a number of, uh, of uh, open uh, courtyards. Uh, already uh, two main uh, courtyards. We can see here also in the photo uh, locating, uh, giving the, the location on the map of the front terrace of uh, the house. And then the deeper level of analysis take us to divide the houses into what I decided to call, uh, this is not an innovation, but I mean, <laughs> I use the word uh, cluster. Uh, or groups of houses uh, to, to be able to divide the village. It's, uh, we have 22 houses. How uh, I will analyze, analyze all these houses all in once. Uh, each house had this um, table of information. Uh, and it was important to understand the, the location, uh, the neighboring houses, the access points to the house, 
uh, the total number of spaces, the to total number of open spaces, and the total number of uh, open court sites. Um, and in 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 this uh, in this step, um, it, it, the information already accumulated from the previous uh, steps of of research uh, appeared to be very important because in this case. Uh, in the cluster of houses we could uh, identify, as you see on the map, uh, each houses are in, in a group together. This whole group, the, the upper one, the, the other one. So each uh, cluster, uh, the, the whole village was divided into eight clusters. Each cluster has uh, from two to four uh, houses. Uh, not only the, sp the open spaces inside uh, the houses were identified, we could see from this uh, previous uh, step how the inhabitants made use also of the outer uh, space that we cannot describe really as uh, public. It's not used only by the inhabitants, uh, by, by, by all the inhabitants, but it's used by, for example, two or three neighboring houses who have access to one small uh, courtyard in the middle. So. This also uh, makes our uh, analysis more flexible that a courtyard does not have to exist inside uh, 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 walls or inside uh, a specific perimeter of, uh, of house. Um, in the next level of uh, study, uh, I analyzed the equipment and installation at the open courtyards. If we need to understand the functions, so it, we must understand uh, what exists in these. So uh, I, I give here examples of the repeated installations. The most important was the, the installation of the water, um, the water storage and the food. And this uh, on, the, on the right uh, side and these are three photos from three different uh, houses. And we can see the place where uh, they put the water jar or the, the zir, as they call it. And in the uh, lower space under the zir, they could store the food like a fridge because the water could give uh, humidity so they can store uh, the food. Uh, we could also see the, the remains of the built-in uh, mastabas where the people sit or sleep, uh, or we see the remains of wooden uh, mastabas and beds. Uh, important finds, especially uh, for uh, comparison between ancient and modern Egypt, were definitely the uh, grinding uh, stones repeated in several uh, courtyards. Um, Another uh, level of analysis uh, showed that through the understanding of the courtyards, we can have different uh, house forms and we can have different categories of privacy. And the discussion uh, or my thoughts about what is private and what is public, um, unfortunately does not believe very much of uh, previous interpretation of that we have to label spaces like this is private and this is public. In real life, or in, in this case study, these boundaries do not exist. These boundaries are really melt because as I said, there are the inner courtyards, there are the, the surrounding uh, courtyards. There are different level of privacy uh, inside each uh, house uh, from the different uh, types of open courtyards, like main central courtyard or uh, room courtyard or back courtyard uh, in each uh, house. I could also uh, re reconstruct uh, these uh, privacy levels. Uh, on the map on the, on the right uh, side, you can see that the, the, the colors give us um, indication uh, about uh, the level of privacy of each uh, space. The lighter the color is, the more public the space is. 
Uh, also, this ex um, label or names I decided to give to the court to the different types of uh, courtyards uh, are um, based on the, the functionality of of the, the this uh, courtyard as I could understand. Uh, so I called this one, for example, the Rome courtyard because uh, through my own analysis and later through the discussion with the inhabitants, this courtyard is made on purpose to be used with the inhabitants or the, the, the people who use this specific room behind. That's why I call it room uh, courtyard. It can be accessed from a main courtyard of a house. Then this also gives a different level of uh, privacy, if we want to say. Um, through the combination, a later combination of the, inter the, the results I have from the interviews, I could then reconstruct the factors that make the people uh, use the open spaces and especially open courtyard in the case of my study. So there are different uh, climatic, practical and social uh, factors. Uh, of course, the ventilation and the aeration are the, the most important in, in this case. And this was also analyzed uh, through understanding uh, the orientation of the open courtyards that are all uh, oriented to the north to catch the northern uh, breeze. Uh, practical factors are simply for uh, domestic activities like preparing uh, food or weaving. Uh, a storage space, as I uh, mentioned, also a space, a space of internal architectural uh, division. A social factor here is uh, that there are different social factors, but the most important is that an open courtyard is a social gathering uh, space and a space to ensure the privacy of closed uh, spaces. Uh, they told me that if they have guests uh, who are not very close to the family, they receive them outside in the terrace outside uh, of the house. But the close uh, guests to the family, they can receive them in the courtyard. How did I apply this methodology on um, or this understanding uh, of practical steps uh, on the ancient uh, sites? Um, I decided here to choose the, the settlement sites of the, the less known uh, settlement sites if we compare them to later periods of uh, ancient Egypt. That's why my case studies uh, are from the pre-dynastic and stop on, uh, on, um, at the end of the Middle uh, Kingdom. Um, for example, how did I use uh, this? Uh, research to uh, have a reinterpretation of the streets of Middle Kingdom uh, Elephantine. Uh, after understanding and reconstructing and reconstructing the uh, the use and the functions and layouts of the streets and pathways in the village of uh, Biga. Um, we, I could have a second look on uh, the previous suggestions of uh, the Middle Kingdom uh, streets of uh, Elephantine and add um, and could see and analyze different categories of streets and different functions and better analyze the evolution of uh, streets in relation to the natural landscape and the natural topography and have a better con contextualization of the use of the open spaces at ancient and modern elephant scene, uh, both, both of them. Um, I think that also my, uh, the, the research uh, helped in uh, having a second, a deeper look on uh, the suggestions that have been proposed by previous uh, scholars about uh, the planning of Middle Kingdom, of some of Middle Kingdom uh, settlement sites like uh, Lahun and Wahsut, for example, uh, and um, not to look uh, sometimes, including myself, we just look at, at the plan of an ancient site as suggested by uh, the excavations uh, as, a, as, a, as a something dead, as something 
that we impose on, on, the, on the site and that's it. Yes, of course, it has a lot of, of suggestion of what we can see from the archaeological remains. But I think and I hope that my, uh, what I proposed for uh, um, uh, the ethno-archaeological uh, case study can bring life to these plants to see different levels of uh, streets, to see different level of accessibility between houses, to see different levels of shared uh, or open spaces between the houses or the buildings. A second look to the courtyard uh, houses of Elephantine as they have been described already by the excavator uh, who excavated this uh, area, uh, Cornelius von Pilgrim. Uh, I could also see what he already suggested uh, and add to his uh, suggestions, different categories of different layouts and functions. Um, also think of the use of open spaces and the possible uh, social implications. Of course, we cannot interview the inhabitants of ancient Elephantine <laughs> anymore, but we can bring life by imagining and uh, reconstructing all these uh, social implications. Um, I think that based on uh, what, what I propose of the understanding of the open courtyards and their use in understanding the house uh, architecture, we can have a re-evaluation of the Middle Kingdom houses typologies that were previously uh, proposed by scholars. Uh, we could, I could also see uh, different categories of different uh, open uh, courtyards in the sites that we as uh, uh, scholars who study these uh, famous sites know them by heart, but I think that after a deeper look, I could see uh, central courtyards, room courtyards, entrance, and also open shared spaces. And all of this, of course, was based on the previous documentation uh, available from the previous excavations of these uh, sites. For example, in, on this uh, plan, giving a comparison between um, some of the residential buildings of, uh, of Lahun and uh, Wahsud, uh, there are similarities that were proposed already by previous uh, scholars, but I, I added to this that we can see the spaces, the repeated spaces and patterns of uh, food and water storage, water basins, for these practical reasons of the, the cool uh, breeze in the courtyard, the orientation of these uh, courtyards, and the courtyard as a connection space, uh, connecting all the spaces uh, around it. And also, of course, the rebuild or deconstruct uh, the privacy uh, patterns. Um, what is behind the understanding of uh, modern or ancient uh, open spaces. Uh, I think that uh, each layout feature uh, of the open space uh, can inform us uh, something behind it. So the understanding of the open space in light of the natural uh, landscape give us the adaptation, um, insights about the adaptation of the natural landscape and its effects on the use of the open space. The locations of uh, the open space give us understanding of the space distribution and spatial relationships between space at both levels of information, uh, semi-micro and micro levels, or the level of the site and the level of the building. Uh, the shape and the dimensions of the open space give us the understanding of the capacity of this open space. The accessibility patterns uh, as I explained, give us the reconstruction of the privacy settings of the open space. Uh, discussing the ethno-archaeology for the understanding of the use of the open, uh, of, of space uh, closed or open at ancient Egyptian uh, settlement sites, I, be I personally believe that this is a methodological uh, tool in practice that I hope, and I hope we will uh, discuss this uh, together today, a methodological tool in practice that is also able for more development and elaboration. Um, 
that can give us more insights about the patterns of the courtyard layouts and functions of the streets layout and functions. And I hope that this also will be a tool to revisit the understanding of house architecture in ancient Egypt. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Fatma, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, uh, before I yield the floor to Clara, I would just like to remind you, please put all of your phones on mute mode, please. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Um, Fatma, I'm super pleased to be here with you tonight and to discuss. But I have to say, I'm not really sure what my role is. So I'm going to engage now with Fatma in a conversation. And if you have some questions, feel free to interrupt me anytime because I may not notice. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm really glad that you made this work. And thank you very much. And I would like to congratulate you to it. I always love it if people come with solid data and have an approach a little bit outside of the box. And I think you have presented very clearly what the upside is. It's like, for example, like this uh, social structure of the streets. I um, I had a smile when I saw the photo of Elephantine Island. I mean, the one with the built bench on the backside and the wooden bench in the front. So if you would excavate this, you would see the uh, built bench most likely, for example. In some cases, like in Upper Egypt, you might be extremely lucky to have the wooden bench, but like in Bhutto, for example, you would have nothing. So you would maybe see, okay, this might be more a corridor, this would be, you know, like we'd like to do our typologies and stuff like this. And you and me and maybe some other people know that this wooden bench is there as far as I remember for 20 years at least, or maybe a previous bench. So it is like a built one. It has the same character, let's say it like this. And what we never can see from the plants, but what we see when we walk through the village is uh, that people sit on their doorsteps. Also the stairs leading up to the house, it's their social space, like a bench and this kind of stuff. To, so to have a feeling of this social space, this outer space, a social space, I mean, it's great that you do your work like this. So thank you for this. And, um, but also something crossed my mind, which I never asked you before, and I, it's maybe a bit naive, but I was wondering why bigger? Because, um, the uh, upsides of a research like this is, of course, that you can speak with the people. So you can ask them, how do you do? Are you here in summer? How do you use it in winter? And so forth. Or if it's something which is related to specific gender roles. But bigger is a bit treated like an archaeological site because it's uh, and have evidence left like 40, 30 to 40 years ago. So it might decay a little bit. Also, objects are not there anymore. And people might not remember that clearly anymore. So was it only a practical reason because you were part of the project and had the access to the documentation and uh, to the site, of course? Or was there any other methodology um, idea behind that? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Clara, and thank you so much for being here today um, um, in this seminar for the discussion. Uh, so. Difficult questions. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, uh, I chose the uh, bigger or bigger chose me if we say it in another uh, another sense. Um, I was fascinated and have this example of elephantine in my mind for so many years, and I kept thinking about it and how. We we uh, how I have the access to to this to these places and um, I didn't yet start this research or even before starting my PhD um, and uh, having the opportunity uh, of talking to the people of course is wonderful and uh, and this is the interest of doing ethnographic uh, research in the first place but uh, as well. Uh, in the case of uh, bigger, it proved that we don't have people living, so it was it was like uh, a wonderful chance to have all freedom to see the 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 outside and the inside uh, places, 
the, the more public, the more uh, private uh, areas. And for an archaeologist who is used to see only a few remains of, uh, of archaeology, and as we always discussed together, uh, this is really Disneyland for archaeologists. I mean, you have everything uh, standing and everything uh, that you can see uh, yourself and see, ah, oh, this is like the grinding stone, the grinding stone, for example, this must be uh, in this place, in the house, not in another place. Uh, and of course, uh, the wonderful chance that I was already a member of uh, the bigger uh, project and I used the chance to, uh, to present my acknowledgements. Uh, to the whole team uh, of the project, especially Dr. Bernadetta Schaefer, who gave me this opportunity to study uh, the open spaces. This was not uh, uh, a specific plan. Yeah, well, the, the open spaces would have been studied anyways, but it was not uh, a specific plan as I structured it for the purpose of my PhD. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity. So bigger really uh, uh, was, uh, great good luck to have the chance to study it to be honest yeah sometimes the sites uh, choose us that's true <laughs> so when you had some biggest a chance to walk through as you like and to document as you like and look on every little detail and then to verify i presume possible your uh, assumption or your understanding with the persons who might have lived in the house or might know the house from before so we have of course a very good control for your method and for your protocol to understand what um, uh, to, to prove if your understanding is correct or if it's too hypothetically. But how do you apply this method into the ancient sites? Or is it, which, what is your security <clears throat> there to follow up to see, okay, I would, okay, you have some architectural layout, you have access points, but we might have, might have had, for example, water there, which we don't have, or water installation, which are not there anymore. You never have the information if there were private guests allowed or not. So uh, how do you deal with that problems then suddenly? Yeah, of course, this is a huge uh, problem and a huge uh, challenge of this ethnoarchaeology. Uh, and uh, for this reason, I, uh, I started my presentation by uh, confirming that uh, um, I don't impose what happens in the modern, must happen in the, in the must have happened in the ancient. Uh, but uh, it's more reconstructing the, the safer uh, patterns. So the, the patterns that we can see in the archaeological evidence, yes, I could safely say if, we, if the archaeologist in the site already said this is a water basin, why should I object? He documented it himself. So this is an obvious comparative to the ancient site, for example. Uh, but for sure, uh, the aspect of uh, of uh, privacy and having guests or not, how can I tell? Um, yeah, maybe we have also a repeated um, feature like the, the, the areas for sitting, the mastaba or the remains of uh, beds in some cases of the ancient uh, sites uh, or sleeping uh, areas identified by archaeologists as, as the sleeping areas, but still uh, who, who slept there, we, we cannot definitely tell, of course. So I, uh, even in, in, my, um, in my dissertation, I wrote all of these are suggestions, ideas, to be on, on the safe side. <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. Um, now I forgot my question, damn it. <laughs> That's the next point. Um, so something else, um, when what I was wondering, so you establish like a kind of protocol of questions you have, and we are in the lucky position uh, that the climate didn't change that much drastically, for at least in the same area. So the Nubian Elephantine area is more or less the same. Delta might be a bit different, but Middle Egypt might be more or less the same. So we can see, okay, for people, it's very useful to sleep outside in summer, but not in winter, and, and, and so forth. We can make some assumptions or suggestions from there safely. Yeah. Um, is there anything else what you would say that was most rewarding from your methods? Most? Sorry? Most rewarding? rewarding. What you say we would have never understood or not that easily understood or you would not have felt comfortable with without studying bigger? Yes, so many things, <laughs> to be honest. Um, starting the, the thing that annoyed me the most as a, a, a young uh, scholar or 
younger, not uh, not so young anymore, but younger at uh, before young my enough. PhD. But uh, but um, at that, how can how did scholars uh, suggest that we have this typology of houses in the Middle Kingdom, uh, five or uh, six rooms, and in this plan, and they draw the plan. Yes, I respect they did the, they did this on the on the base of the evidence they had at their archaeological sites. But this was not convincing for me that, that uh, this was all what I should know about ancient Egyptian uh, houses. Of course, I build so many on what they proposed, but specifically not on the typology. And uh, I always felt that there is something more deeper and more uh, practical, uh, not, not as strict as having a typology. Uh, but having seen an example of Bega, or I'm sure this would have happened in another any other site, that house forms are to be understood, or for me, this is what I believe, are to be understood through their functions, through their uh, divisions, through their usage in the end. We cannot say uh, this, uh, this type one, two, three without convincing me what happened in these spaces. So, and also they suggested the types without interpreting, uh, giving in enough interpretation what happened in these uh, spaces. Mm. Yeah, the problem with the typologies is that they're mainly based too much on architecture. Nothing against architecture, of course, but uh, it gives you only the outline of the house, but not, the, let's say, the soul or the life. Exactly. Um, which would a uh, comparison with modern societies mm. would help or what uh, I'm mainly doing is to work with the finds and work with the spatial analysis and see mm. which if you have a very good preservation, of course, uh, yeah. uh, what you can gain from there. And in this sense, I have to say, I agree with Felix uh, Arnold that I don't think that, um, especially not for the old kingdom, the middle kingdom, really like domestic, domestic space that you can define firm room function. For me, it's more multifunctional. Of course, you have some areas, then you have a bakery, you possibly wouldn't wave there or, or make something very fine. You would do something related to heat otherwise. Um, some areas where you want to sleep, you keep them possibly clean. Some areas are very well made for storage, but you still can do also work in the storage area. It doesn't need to be only one side. Um, so, but when, when I follow you uh, approach, it's more, I would maybe, it's maybe, I was thinking maybe it's more of a, a problem of terms that I, or you and I would use different terms. So when you say possibly function or what is what you mean as a general thing and what I think is about the activities would yeah, took place. Yeah, yeah. So you would also maybe make this, uh, that function is not the same as activities, yeah. the same uh, distinction. Yeah, thank you so much for this, uh, this uh, idea because, uh, yeah, I don't completely disagree with uh, Felix Arnold and with you because uh, the, 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 the work on the ground the proves that uh, in the ancient sites, of course, we cannot say this was a living room and this was a kitchen and this was another mistake of the house typologies. We cannot say this is a kitchen and the, the now the, the reality proves that there was no uh, concept of our concept of kitchen in ancient Egypt. Yeah. So uh, I, I especially if I might add, if you can use trisology and uh, make some residue analysis or whatever, and you exactly, suddenly see yeah. the whole range of things exactly. which could have taken place at the same space which you formerly called kitchen. Yeah. Exactly. Say. Yes, and uh, they can cook or prepare food anywhere. This yeah. concept of kitchen of that we have now doesn't didn't exist yeah. unless we have more evidence in the future that may maybe prove us wrong. Yes, yes. Um, or, sorry if I interrupt. <laughs> uh, this completely I agree for like domestic, domestic space, like the little houses on Elephantine Island and so forth. But it's something different if you have exceed production, if you cook for soldiers, if you cook for workmen's large group, of course, then we have very defined, especially uh, food production areas, bakeries and storage area. So this is maybe this is a general problem or general weakness we have in settlement archaeology is always what we want to compare. So each site having a very different history of excavation, very different state of publication, very different state of preservation. And most of the sites which are better excavated are those which we tend to say, oh, it's something special. You can't take it as an example for something. It's a specific role, either 
is it a pyramid city with Amana and it's on China as a border zone, Dakla in its position in, in Western in the Western Desert and so forth, which made me want to think one day, uh, maybe we have only special cities in Egypt, we have nothing else. So we have possibly no normal <laughs> ordinary city in each settlement is something specific that could be. But still what we have, and this is maybe approach for you to, if you want to follow up this kind of uh, uh, research further, is if you would distinguish more between a complex like Hahun and Barsoot and Elephantine Island. So either you stay like you focus on formal or standard architecture like in palaces or the pyramid towns with their, uh, especially in their, in their first uh, state as their uh, supply areas. So it has a very different intention for the buildings and also for the use than, of course, something on Elephantine Island, so also planned, but it was never meant to be something big like this. So this would be something I would suggest to do, to focus more or to distinguish more between the yeah. little examples that we have. <laughs> and I was wondering completely out in the blind that maybe Tel Aviv could be a good field for you because it's relatively close in time. It's the same climate zone, of course. And um, there are not many finds preserved in situ, as most floors are gone, but there are a lot of ground plants, at least, and a lot of different type of yeah. uh, courtyards that's, uh, that I uh, seen there. And um, also, at least there is quite a lot of publication about this. So this could be also maybe interesting for compare to make more comparison about outer space, inner space, and who has access to what in the future. Yeah, I I, uh, I totally agree, and um, uh, on this point of uh, of uh, types of uh, settlements, yes, this is another huge problem also in the literature or in our understanding of the settlements. Um, and I agree that we cannot take a site uh, like Lahun to compare it directly with Elephantine, for example, for the obvious differences in the archaeology and in the development of uh, both uh, sites. Uh, but why not revisit uh, these labels uh, of, uh, of uh, describing sites as uh, workman village or pyramid town? Yes, I, okay, I don't fully disagree. <laughs> but also, if we study well the development of these uh, settlements, we will see that at some point they lost their status as pyramid towns or as workmen uh, village or uh, their original purpose, if we want to say. And they had uh, changes and modifications uh, in their uh, buildings or in their open spaces and so on. So yes and no, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Which would make it in the, this case as a very uh interesting case example if it's well enough stratified yes, and yes, published because yes. then you might have a more deeper glimpse uh, what people really wanted in this time uh, at least at this time in this moment yes we want a courtyard no we divide the courtyard and use it as a stable or just as an uh, example exactly yeah so it goes possibly more to the to the actual needs of what a group would mean uh, would lift they would have mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, maybe it will come out also that all, everything shares some specific key points, which are always uh, the same things uh, compared to uh, related to the environment, to the heat, to the dust, for example, in the in the more desert areas, and possibly to the rain in the northern area. And this would go through all the time. But I guess you know, if you have more case examples in a small region, you may have also some. Hopefully, <laughs> you would find maybe one or other as a question you would like to follow up and maybe get some results no. or not, but then at least you know. <laughs> yes, and uh, I, uh, as I said in the, for opening our discussion, uh, yeah, my uh, methodology uh, really need to be tested. I mean, maybe it doesn't work out anymore. I mean, how uh, how can we? Uh, or it needs to be not. I don't want to say it doesn't work, or... but it can always. We can always add. Let's put it exactly. Like yes, yes. Or modify it. Yes. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Thank you for the lectures, but my question about during your uh, study, do you find any uh, any, any uh, in the architect they use solar systems 
I don't mean solar system by the sophisticated now, but there are different simple solar systems like heating water or as uh, used in the Coptic uh, monasteries, they use domes in the, on the ceiling. The, the dome on the ceiling, <coughs> it's a theory that the sun when move, it hit part of the dome and the other is cold. So it, it uh, make uh, the eddy currents. This eddy currents will, will make the, the room cool. And later on, Hassan Fathi built uh, a village at Nuba. And it's called the uh, Marat Hassan Fathi. Uh, I think uh, the, the village is named Garan. And uh, uh, this this has come from this ancient uh, time during the uh, Coptic era. So mm -hmm. there is there is no symptoms in your uh, study about uh, uh, using such uh, solar uh, systems? Uh, no, not, thank e you. not exactly. Thank you for the question. Uh, not, not exactly in the, in the case studies that I, uh, I, I presented here or the case studies that I studied in uh, my research, but um, yeah, I mean, we, we had other installations or other um, uh, solutions to deal with the, the, the climate in general, as I presented. But this uh, specific example didn't uh, exist. But thank you for the for the example. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you for the lecture. Thank I you. wanted to ask a question about a bit about modern Egypt, the link between old and uh, modern. Why do you think people gave up their open space now, or did it, they replace it with balconies? You know and. Uh, we're having a big residential building with back and front yards and now mere windows. Okay, um, difficult question. <laughs> Maybe you have to do another on, ethnographic. Question. Maybe it depends on whether you're talking about the villages or the big cities. Give me an example, yeah, Amira. I'm inspired by how you explain ancient Egypt. And I'm just thinking like in ancient districts of, uh, let's say, Labbasaya, where I grew up, okay. uh, we had very uh, big uh, houses. Uh, and then uh, you would find uh, like villas, okay, uh, for only one family or a big family, which is uh, found in villages. And then uh, you can find the, the more modern, uh, three or four story building, mm -hmm. but it has a front yard and a backyard and a big big space and then you see like in the 70s they were all demolished and they were uh, replaced by buildings smaller buildings with no uh, um, front or back uh, yards with a balcony but they all had balconies yes and in the 90s the, all the balconies were probably gone and because they were all you know um, used up more uh, to make the apartments more spacious mm -hmm. but the people kept some um, uh, I don't know. They kept standing in windows and standing in balconies and staying down, down downstairs, hanging. So I was just one. Um, yes, I mean, uh, thank you for the question. But uh, first, first of all, I think it's difficult to uh, to compare uh, what I presented here as the rural uh, settlement, uh, village uh, environment, to what happens in uh, in any district of uh, modern Cairo, contemporary Cairo. It's difficult to compare. For sure, it's the main uh, similar purposes, many similar purposes in both cases, but it's difficult to compare. I would say uh, uh, in Cairo, the, uh, the, the problem of the space in the end, I mean, we people don't have any more this uh, larger spacious uh, lands to build uh, um, houses, so they have to uh, compromise. And then in the end, they say that we will not sleep in the balcony, but we need a room to sleep in, so they they give up the balcony to have a, a sleeping room or a, another closed uh, living uh, room, for example. So I think it's for practical reasons. Uh, but uh, I, I must say that in the villages, open spaces until now are 
major spaces, just go to any village, uh, any close village in Giza or any, any other village. People are sitting outside of their houses most of the day, especially, of course, uh, the women and the children. So, uh, so this is how I, uh, I, I personally got interested in open spaces. How didn't we compare or think about people using the ancient space, open spaces in ancient uh, Egypt? Also, it's not the same uses or needs. Like you don't grind your flour on your balcony. You don't cook on your balcony. You have a, you have a, oh, you can, but you have a <laughs> kitchen <laughs> oftentimes. And also it's not the same technologies. We have AC now. Uh, we have uh, windows. Yeah, no, it's true. True. Yeah. Yeah. I I was just building up to a small question that I had. You mentioned the climatic uh, effects, especially the winds. Did anyone mention light? Because uh, as I recall in traditional Nubian uh, architecture, there are just few openings. So you don't have, I guess you don't have so much light in the closed rooms. Is it possible that people also go to the did people mention that they go to the to the court so that they can do things that require light uh, some of them briefly mentioned this yes thank you for the question I didn't, it was not uh, very clear uh, yes some of them mentioned but we also found already uh, lamps uh, gas gas lamps in the remains of gas lamps in the houses uh, in the rooms of course so uh, they had uh, solutions as of well. course, mm -hmm. yeah. but I think you mentioned weaving. I'm, I, I've never yes. weaved before, but I think maybe with natural Weave, light, yeah. you probably see better. Exactly, I, I agree, and this uh, this was one uh, of the things. Uh, not they didn't say specifically weaving, but they didn't. They said for having more better lighting for the different activities. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, behind Zoom. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Fatma, for the presentation. It is very interesting. I was just thinking also like working on many settlements that like at Giza, for example, that we have many different open spaces, but in general, the site is very dense, so there is no light. So it's always like uh, that we can take also another factor into consideration, like the open roofs and the activity on the roof. Uh, and this is, you know, what we see in the archaeology. Mm. And so this is one thing. And also another that also working in Teleretaba when we have houses from the third inter intermediate period, and we see many changes in the function of the spaces within the house, but also outside, that even the open spaces uh, on their function uh, would be changed over, over time. And probably there are many different factors, of course, like changes within families, you know, like, I mean, maybe like also in the number of the members of the family, but also uh, what is interesting that like they would change places for like um, discarding garbage. Mm -hmm. And so like the garbage and then also uh, this new term that we have on archaeology that we call uh, archaeology of senses and, you know, like the smells. Um, would uh, would affect the function of the spaces, you know, like because we don't think of this, but of sh for sure, uh, or I would think that it would be important. It's in in daily life, yeah. So just some uh, some thoughts. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, um, thank you for all the interesting thoughts and uh, many of them I uh, I didn't directly consider in my research. So thank you for. Uh, yeah, offering uh, new uh, areas of research. Uh, I will. Uh, I would answer the the question about uh, the Giza settlements, the Giza workmen settlements, because I briefly tried to uh, to make analysis of Hait uh, al Ghurab uh, and uh, the Khinzikawas settlement as well. Um, yeah, but it, uh, one of the most challenging ancient sites, Hait al Ghurab. I mean, it's already very well. Uh, published, uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the and, and already we have uh, a lot of analysis for the for the open spaces by the excavators and it inspired my work uh, a lot. Uh, 
but it's already uh, uh, if uh, like final uh, pre-final judgment that because this settlement was uh, made on purpose to be controlled or to, to control the workmen to make uh, to be always uh, having a control over their movement so this is made on purpose to have the spaces very dense not to let them move uh, to uh, let them only uh, move in the spaces the higher uh, officials want them to to be so it was really a challenging, uh, <laughs> an interesting but challenging for for my uh, research about the the roofs. Uh, yes, I mean this would be an area to to investigate uh, further. It's challenging because we have very little uh, uh, archaeological evidence, uh, but uh, maybe uh, a step to understand also in the modern uh, record. For example, in uh, Biga, I didn't mention the, in the presentation, but they use the roof to keep uh, the, um, the material that they would recycle, like the tins, the, the, the paper, the, the things that they can use later. They live on, on, uh, on an island, uh, not uh, everything is accessible to them, so they need to uh, recycle uh, everything. So the roofs of the houses were the spaces to keep the recycled uh, material, for example. So uh, it's something to investigate further. Thank you, Anna. It's very interesting, this uh, differentiation between use of the roof and use of the courtyard. Uh, that's yeah. an interesting thing to keep yeah. in mind. Uh, I would also just like to jump on your remark about the senses. I think it's very interesting. Uh, but also we have to consider that some things may not be perceived the same ways by everybody. Of course, the sense of smell, uh, especially for I think for European people who come to Cairo, we're sometimes taken by a lot of pungent smells and a lot of people here either do not care or are not, you know, because they're more used to especially the smell of animals, for example. So it's also interesting to take that into account. But of course, it's a very interesting uh, avenue. Uh, on the matter of garbage, I have a very specific question. Sorry. Please, yes. uh, on the map that you showed of Biga, yeah. uh, I'm not sure, but I think I read the garbage disposal areas yes, that yes. were very uh, yeah. intricate. Ha why? <laughs> no, it's just a matter of uh, my artistic oh, talent. Okay. I, thought, okay. I was no. wondering if maybe there were trenches. No, I was very uh, talented to uh, just make uh, a decision to make it uh, clear to mm -hmm. me. Uh, it, has no, it has no uh, scientific reason, to be honest. Okay. Uh, but maybe it's the chance to say that uh, uh, these uh, these were the areas of um, the slopes. Mm. So the, the 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 this is as you say as you saw the it's very uh, hilly the the island the village. So the with the wind the garbage uh, stays on the slopes. Um. So uh, may, this later was another benefit. Maybe I didn't show another map, but yeah, I wanted to show the very first. Um, map and how was my own uh, uh, interaction with the space? Thank you. Thank you. This is actually a twofold question. Did you find any objects still uh, lying on the floor of the houses, either just people do not bother to go to the garbage disposal area or just because they abandoned the house, they just left some stuff? Yeah. Yeah, because of the second reason. Uh, people, especially in the case of Biga, we cannot uh, reproduce, of course, this in other abandoned village. But in our case, in the, in the village, uh, people always believed they will return to the houses. Oh. They left everything, not everything, but many things. Um, even in, in some houses, we uh, still have some clothes of people in big uh, boxes because they believed oh in very bad the status of uh, of conservation but they always believed i will come back to this house i will live there again we even uh, found the uh, toys of children so uh, every really everything um, was mostly there so that's why i say it's disneyland for an archaeologist i mean you can see everything you can touch you can imagine what is this and so on so okay mm -hmm. any other questions from the audience Thank you for your interesting you. research and 
it always fascinates me to connect to create this connection between modern Egyptian and ancient Egyptian and some sometimes it's mere sentiment but here we can see that uh, there is some like scientific approach to to see that the 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 connection a, 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 a very even visual can you can yeah. with with visual you can easily connect the two two worlds uh, so i have a question and comment one the, the question is about the you said on the on the island there were another village was it inhabited no the whole island was uh, was uh, abundant the two villages were abundant for for the same time exactly mm -hmm. uh, but they were different uh, cases like uh, the the other village was uh, had a different house distribution was much uh, smaller uh, some years later after uh, i finished my own research after the whole project uh, left there was a decision to turn some houses to a restaurant and uh, an eco lodge for example so uh, uh in different cases there, there is a huge um, distance between uh, both between both villages yeah for, for for me it was maybe interesting or weird to 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 study the, i understand the reasons why uh, it was easy for for you to to uh, get access there but i uh, i felt it would like isn't there any other like near near islands with with inhabited villages yeah many all the islands around uh, bigger are inhabited so you have uh, hesa island uh, you have uh, um what else clara you can help me please <laughs> uh, you have um, not the islands but you have other villages inland tingar uh, Harb, uh, Sahil, a bit further yeah. uh, so all these villages are inhabited all of them yeah i'm asking and i, I visited them too ah, so. yeah exactly but, but not studied i visited like a tourist to see uh what the people are doing there and to compare it to what i have in in bigger yeah because like you 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 go to an empty house and you imagine what people were yes. doing there and yes. i think with with uh with with the, with the inhabited village it's easier to to see in in, in by uh, in a, a live uh, how people interact or use these spaces so uh, yeah. if for me it was absolutely bit, it was a bit like why didn't you choose and an, like i understand why you choose bigger but even you didn't like try to compare how the i did i did i just didn't uh, mention this uh, here but actually my first uh, reason one of my first reasons uh, was the uh, elephantine i mean i lived on elephantine for so many months on, in different years so uh, i lived myself the experience uh, no, not not the exact experience of the local uh, inhabitants but i saw it for my eyes for so many years already uh, and for the starting the research uh, myself and my colleagues on the same uh, project we visited many other uh, neighboring uh, villages the the majority are the same there are slight differences between some villages due to the different in some cases due to the different uh, topography for example biga is very hilly elephantine is very flat so uh, you cannot always compare the everything every single detail but you can compare the the life of the people and their daily activities so also the the your your differentiation between the function and activity uh, reminded me of Bourdieu's uh, uh, Kabylie house. He, he he wrote about the Kabylie house in Algeria and how people use the the spaces in for different activities during different times uh, in the day and night and what are the male spaces and female spaces and how this uh, changes all the time i think you, you you slightly touched upon this with this differentiation but you didn't go further with this uh, and i think it would be interesting to maybe if if you studied like alive uh, like houses with inhabit uh, with with people there and to see how the activities changes during different times different seasons different uh, like uh, with flood or like stuff yes. like this i think it would be interesting to see yes. how the, the 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 daily life 
changes with with the function and activity in the same space like that. yes i i totally agree uh i didn't go deep in, in this uh, area uh maybe briefly mentioning this aspect of uh uh, privacy of the courtyard or the terrace, but we I didn't go deeply in the if we call it the gender uh, division <laughs> or the also the the time of the day. There are, by the way, uh, some studies by uh, some scholars who try to do this in ancient Egyptian houses as well, especially the scholars who uh, studied the 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 lighting. Very, very few, but very important uh, eye opener to, to this discussion. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Did you um, visit the place where the people moved from bigger? No. Like the new bigger? No. So do you know um, if they kept the same organization of space or where the house is already built and it's was not their choice anymore? Uh, actually, Early in our research, we discovered that everyone went to a different place in uh, ah. in the city, mostly. So uh, yeah, it was not that uh, tempting to us to do uh, research. It was on my respect to the city, of course. Um, if, if there is no question for now, I just have uh, one last one. Uh, I was uh, wondering, on the the sheets that you saw that you used for your research the the sheets for the each table, yes, yeah for yes. each individual house uh, one of them you noted that there were 28 uh, space units yes first of all can i ask like roughly how did you identify those are they mainly like different rooms yes okay yes. so this... that was a big house the biggest house of the of the village okay yeah. so mm -hmm. uh, of course for an archaeologist when you see a layout with a lot of rooms you autom your mind automatically goes to elite or rich people so maybe that's one of the biggest lessons that we can get from ethnography uh, uh what about these people are they specifically rich or respected in the community of the village or is it just because it's a huge family living together or uh, so uh, our uh, investigations to, with the inhabitants um, showed that this uh, was the, yes, the richest family of the, the village and uh, the one who also, so one family and hosted many uh, small, many relatives in the, this big uh, house. Uh, so yes, of course, this is related directly to the level, the financial status of the people, of course. Thank you. So, alhamdulillah, mm. the archaeologist is not always uh, wrong. <laughs> yeah, That's no, a good thing. To know. We're always right. <laughs> Anything, any other suggestion? or? All right. Well, thank you again so much, Fatma and uh, Clara. Thank you. It was especially interesting this emphasis on the uh, multifunctionality of spaces, and I think you've got a lot of different avenues to explore for your upcoming symposium in November. I hope so. <laughs> thank you so thank much, you, everyone, and thank you, Clara. Yeah.